Yes, I know it's late, but finally my review of Chaos Demons is here, and in this video we'll find out if they are in fact as frightening as demons should be. Welcome to the channel. If you're new here, we cover all things 40k from live stream games, sit and talks, reviews, and all kinds of other content with more content coming very, very soon. If you want to support us, please think about hitting that subscribe button, maybe even clicking the little bell notification icon so that you get notified every time we drop a new video or we go live on stream. And if you really want to support us, think about becoming a member of the channel. If you click that join button, it gives you a, lift, a list of rewards depending on which level you pick. It's really the best way to support the channel. We're very, very grateful for our members. Come and join us in the Great Hall. It is a fantastic community of absolute heroes. So this video is late. Games Workshop did send me through Codex Chaos Demons and I got my NDA release date wrong. I'm going to own up to it right now. The date in which I thought this went live was a week later than it actually went live for pre-order and so I'd missed it and I was at Element Games, our sponsors, link video description below, in Stockport for the DeploymentZone.tv open day, hanging out with some wonderful people from the DZTV community, and everyone else's content went live and mine didn't. At which point I thought I'd missed the boat, and I thought that I wouldn't be able to do my Chaos Demons review. However, we asked the community, the response was overwhelmingly, yes, please, let's have another review from you. So here we are, this is our review of Chaos Demons. Massive thank you Games Workshop for sending this out to me to review, because it really helps us, it really helps the channel. Um, we'll see if we keep getting these with all the leaks that are going on. Please stop supporting leaks. Anyway, if you're new to these videos and you haven't seen this kind of review before, we don't do the same as everybody else does. You won't get a top-down camera. You won't be able to screenshot every page and save it so you don't have to buy the book. We don't do that. We like to do things a little bit differently here. And so I'm going to cover off 15 specific points broken down into five categories. My 15 hot takes from Codex Chaos Demons. And we'll break them down into the five standard categories. So what are the three biggest changes for Codex Chaos Demons? What are the three biggest winners? What are the three biggest losers? What are the three standout units in the Codex? And what are my three favorite stratagems? That last point we're tweaking for this specific codex because of the way stratagems work in this codex. And we're actually going to change that to four, one for each of the Chaos Deities. The first thing that I want to say about Codex Chaos Demons before we get into this review, though, is I think this is a fantastic codex. I think Games Workshop have done a really top job. It's actually been hard finding things like losers in this codex. And I think it's a really nicely balanced, neat and well put together book. Uh, it's been a pleasure to use it. So I have used this twice on the channel already. Um, at the point in which this video goes out, it should be only twice on the channel already. Once for members only, skull tiers and above, and once for everybody to see. Um, I've also used this on deploymentzone.tv once already as well. So you can check out links for that if you want to go and watch some pre-recorded content or streams using Chaos Demons. Uh, and it's been a joy to use this book. I think it's a really good job. I think demons are frightening now. I think people will be fearful of demons. But what I do think is they have not become the latest meta-chasing hot garbage cheese book like we have seen in previous codexes. So I don't think we'll suddenly see 10,000 new demon players who have, I've always loved demons. I've always loved their narrative. I've always been a demons fan. It's weird because you weren't before the new codex strange that you've never mentioned it before like we see with tau and eldar and tyranids i've always loved tyranids i've always loved their narrative never had a tyranids army for the last 10 years but i've always loved their narrative they've always been my favorite faction anyway let's get into it here's my 15 hot takes so we're going to start with the three biggest changes in codex chaos demons and i'm going to try and keep saying codex chaos demons and not getting it wrong and the first one of those three biggest changes is the new warp storm ability now we have seen in previous codexes lots of these types of abilities that have come into fruition we've seen lots of factions get their own faction specific ability which is a bolt on to their chapter tactics and their normal rules that allows them to do something a little bit extra a little bit different and more importantly more narratively on the tabletop now uh, the warp storm is a version of this however this is a version of this that i think has been done perfectly well and i'll explain why it's not too broken and it's not too complicated it's very simple to understand it's very simple to apply um, and it's narrative as well. It's very narratively focused. So what is the Warp Storm? Well, at the start of the battle round, a Chaos Demons player will roll 8d6 
and each result of a four plus will generate them a single warp storm point. So if you roll three four pluses, you get three warp storm points, and if you roll five four pluses, you get five warp storm points. There are ways to manipulate warp storm points with some relics and stuff so you can gain extra. However, typically, that's going to be how you generate your warp storm points. That's it. Simple as. Now, every single Chaos Demons player will get access to eight Chaos Undivided Warp Storm based abilities. Some of them will allow you to do things like increase your demonic fear. Some of them will give you things like minus one to hit at ranged uh, against ranged attacks for everything 12 inches away from the enemy. Some really strong but nice and fluffy abilities and they are pointed, Warp Storm pointed appropriately and they'll tell you when to use them. So for example, if you want to make your army minus one to hit against enemy ranged firepower, if you're more than 12 inches away, you do it at the start of the enemy shooting phase and you spend three Warp Storm points. It says it in the ability. Really nice, really, really clear. If you only generate generate your mathematical average of four, using three on one ability straight away means that's the only thing you're going to do that battle round. So there's a real trade-off as to whether you do or don't want that minus one to hit because there's other abilities that you might want to use. If you're a corn Demon player and you did roll that four, you might, for example, want to spend four of your warp storm points in your fight phase to gain plus one attack to every model in your army. So that's why it's important that you balance when you're spending your warp storm points, and that's why I think it's a nice, fair application to the rule. Now, we mentioned the eight chaos and divided ones. Depending on how many detachments you've got, which are dedicated to a single deity, for example, a corn demon detachment or a Nurgle demon detachment, um, depends on how many additional abilities you gain access to. Every single chaos god has access to three additional warp storm abilities if there is a detachment dedicated to that specific chaos god. But if you use those abilities, they only impact um, chaos demons units with that specific keyword. So if you use a corn specific um, warp storm ability, it will only apply to corn specific models. Okay, again, it's really nice, it's really clean, it's really easy. I've used it a few times, it's super tidy, I really like it. Warp Storm is a huge plus in my eyes. So the second biggest change is really split the community half in half this one, I think, and that's Demonic Invulnerability. Demonic Invulnerability is a new type of saving throw never before seen in 40k, well, for as long as I've been playing at least, and basically it's an unmodifiable invulnerable save. And when I say unmodifiable, that means it also can't be removed by things like Tau Rail Cannons on Hammerheads. So you can't ignore it. The other change to it is it's split in two. You have a part and then a second part, a five plus four plus, for example, or a three plus six plus or whichever it might be. The first part of your demonic invulnerability save is against melee based attacks. So your attacks in close combat. The second part of the Demonic Invulnerability save is against ranged attacks, so attacks that are shot at you. And they're, they're often different. So a typical blood letter of Korn has a 5 plus, 4 plus. So against ranged attacks, he has a 4 plus invulnerable save. Can't be modified, can't be ignored. But the second you get in close and you can stick that silver cross in him to banish the demon, he goes to just a 5 plus, so he's less resilient in melee. So he wants to charge in, he wants to swing first and murder you in the hope that you don't get the time to respond and swing back because then you've got more chance of killing him. You want to close with the demon, but you don't want to give him the initiative. Um, so each demon is a slightly different. For example, they have a 3 plus, I think, against ranged attacks and a 6 plus, no, yeah, and a 6 plus against melee. So depending on which god, which unit it is, it changes. Now we did a video about this before and I kind of slammed it for being extra complicated and I didn't really like it. And some of that still remains, like the fact that it's completely unmodifiable. Why suddenly release loads of units into the game that can ignore invulnerable saves if you're then going to invent an unmodifiable invulnerable save? Seems weird. Seems like we just shouldn't have things that ignore invulnerable saves in the first place, right? That would make much more sense rather than this crazy arms race. Having said that, now I've used it a few times. It's not that bad. It's okay. Um, and it has definitely made the demons more resilient. So it's a huge plus point there, a uh, huge plus point there because it's made them much more resilient. My demons now typically last on a, song, a table a lot longer than they used to. So my third biggest change in Codex Chaos Demons is an odd one because it's not about data sheets or units or rules specifically, but about the actual book itself. And that's the layout of the Codex. The layout of the Codex is really nice. We've been asking them to move Crusade rules and relocate them. And they've finally done this. And so the Crusade rules have been moved to the back of the book, basically. They're pre-dated, they're pre-point, sorry, and they're pre-profiles, um, uh, weapon profiles, but they're after all of the data sheets. So now if you don't want to play Crusade, like the vast majority of you don't, and you just want to use your Chaos Demons Codex for pickup games at your local gaming store or at hobby weekends or even at tournaments, you can now open the book for your relics and your warlord traits, etc. And you don't have to, oh, I've opened it in Crusade Rules again. Flick past the 12 rules of Crusade that I've never actually ever used or looked at in the whole time I've owned this code. Oh, finally, I might have got to it. That part has gone. 
In terms of layout, what they've also done is they segregated each of the Chaos Gods into their specific sections. You have the Book of Corn, the Book of Nurgle, the Book of Zinch, the Book of Slanesh, right? It's really nice that you can only, if you're only running a Corn Demon's attachment, you've literally got to worry about like 10 pages. That's all you've got to worry about. You open it to that section, there you go. If you're going to bolt in a Slanesh attachment, cool, you've only got that last few pages to worry about as well. But you know that you go to the Slanesh area and the thing you're looking for, which is Slanesh, is in that area somewhere really nice i prefer using a book at the tabletop i hate using digital i much prefer using a book at the tabletop so having it laid out in a way that's logical and that makes sense and is really easy to use is a huge positive this was a top whoever laid this out this is a top job top job massive massive kudos to you it's much better so we're going to move on to the three biggest winners and i've grouped them together a little bit in some instances because this is quite hard the book on the whole has just been improved across the board um, and you'll see this when we go on to the three biggest losers. But across the board, it's just got better. And so it was quite hard to nail down individual biggest winners in the codex. Um, I wanted to throw corn in there because as a corn player, I've noticed a huge difference. But I feel like that might have been biased. So we're going to start with, number one, Greater Demons. Now, Greater Demons have seen a huge wounds increased everywhere. Typically, a toughness increase everywhere. And attacks increase everywhere. They're just more frightening, more resilient, more scary. And more like a Greater Demon should be. Greater Demons, I've used Scarbrand and a Bloodthirster on no less than five occasions so far since this book has come out. And I feel like they're terrifying now. I feel like they're absolute bullet magnets and people really want to kill them. When they find out what they can do when they get into combat, people find that they want to get rid of them pretty quickly. And yet with some of the abilities they have access to, they're significantly more resilient, not to not to mention the wounds increase, the toughness increase, and the demonic invulnerability save that's been brought in to, to make them that, that little bit harder to kill. So Greater Demons, huge winner in the Codex. Talking about big scary demons with big scary wins, number two is Belakor. We'll go into some more detail later because you might find out that he is one of my standout units as well. But Belakor is terrifyingly good now. And there is a reason why if you've been following other channels out there, you will notice that Belakor has been in almost all of the Chaos Demons battle reports because he's just brilliant. Belakor is a great little unit. Some important things to note for him before we go into the more gritty detail of him later. He has all four Chaos Demon keywords so he can go into any detachment and not break that detachment's faction. For example, you can dump him in a corn detachment and he's got the corn keyword so he doesn't break the corn abilities that you'll gain by being in that detachment. Or he's a supreme commander so you can chuck him in a supreme command detachment and bolt him onto basically anything chaos, which is really tasty. His warlord trait's decent as well because he buffs demon units. So a lot of Bellacor's ability buffs specifically demon units rather than disciples of Bellacor units. So he's usable within chaos demons even if you want to run corn or Slanesh or Nurgle. Bellacor, big winner. I think he's amazing. Some people will say he's got worse because you can't obscure him, but his toughness has, I think, gone up. We'll go into that in just a moment. My third standout unit is Heralds. Seems weird, right? We would typically see Heralds anyway, but with the boons and buffs that we've seen to Greater Demons in the Codex, I thought there was a possibility that you might see less Heralds because Greater Demons just are fantastically good and ridiculously powerful now. So what they've done is for every greater demon in the codex that you take, you can take a herald of the same god without taking up a force organization slot. So if you take two greater demons in your battalion, you can also take two heralds and still have a HQ slot left over for an additional HQ. I've been running a single battalion for my corn demons and running five HQ choices. It's really tasty. It's really nice. In a world where Warzone Nephilim exists and you start with six command points, you don't really want to be bolting on a patrol detachment or a spearhead detachment or an outright detachment just to unlock more HQ slots for characters that offer auras and buffs. You don't really want to be doing that. It's expensive. So to give you a free herald slot for every greater demon is quite tasty. It's quite nice. I feel like that makes heralds a winner because I will chuck, typically see a couple chucked in now for the 100 points that they are because they do offer, they do offer a lot of utility as well heralds having my heralds in my corn army is is quite tasty alongside two greater demons and karanak i love it so now we move on to the hardest part of the review and the reason why it's the hardest part of the review is because on the whole this has just been improved i've got two losers that i feel are kind of legitimate and one which is a bit clutching at straws and i just have to make something up to fill the gap right so the first biggest loser in codex chaos demons is furies why are they a loser well, they don't exist anymore. They've just been removed. So anybody who went out there and bought the Warcry, was it, Furies before, so they could run Furies in their Chaos Demons list, or anyone who's converted Furies because the old models were horrible, or anyone who part with those old models and bought loads of them, gone. 
Removed. Got rid of. So, no point talking about them. The second biggest loser in the codex for me has been Nurgle, and I'll explain. It was a load of abilities that specific Chaos Gods had in the previous codex, which kind of added some narrative flavor to them and made them good or, or whatever. Uh, for example, with my corn demons, I had unstoppable ferocity. So if I charged, I was plus one attack, plus one strength on the charge. Uh, and that's now been just absorbed into the profile. So I'm up to strength five, up to two attacks per model. Really good. I prefer that. Much better. Makes the demon frightening all the time rather than just on the charge. Less places for me to go and look at rules or rules to remember because it's just on the data sheet. Much, much better. Nurgle lost Disgustingly Resilient, which was a 5-up feel no pain. They have gone up to Toughness 5 and 2 wounds for Plague Bearers, but I don't feel like that's enough in the current meta of 40k. So it's just not brilliant as a change. Toughness 5 orcs everywhere, Gravis all over the place. Toughness 5 isn't uncommon now, nor is 2 wounds. More importantly, nor is minus 1 damage. So typically the weapons that we see on the battlefields of the 41st millennium in the current edition of the game will make very light work of plague bearers who are toughness five with two wounds. I don't feel like that's a strong place for them to be in considering they're supposed to be the most resilient of things in existence. When you consider them to a plague marine, I think a plague marine is even more resilient than a plague bearer. It's a shame. Nurgle's not bad. To be clear, I said I'm clutching at straws. I just feel like they're not as resilient as they should be for the foot troops, the foot soldiers of the god of pestilence. Third and final, here's me really clutching up straws. Your opponent is the biggest loser. Why? Well, he used to be able to roll up to a table with nothing, really. He could have bought this pen and he'd probably beat your corn demon's army. Well, now that's not the case anymore. Now he will only beat your corn demons, uh, your corn demons, look at that, your chaos demons army, if he really goes for it. When he turns up the table now, he should really be terrified and mortified of what you might be able to do to him with your corn demons. So he's a loser because he doesn't get as good of a time, as easy as a time anymore. It's not easy anymore. It's harder now. He's a loser. He's also a loser because he doesn't play corn demons. Right? That's a thing. And now we're going to move on to my three standout units. And it's no surprise that the first one, top of the list, is in fact Bellacore. He can be plugged into any army. He's incredibly useful. He's more resilient than he ever was. He's toughness seven at 20 wounds now with that four plus four plus demonic invulnerability save. He's got a raft of decent psychic powers he has access to. His warlord trait is decent because he can pick any demon's core unit and give them reroll to hits. It's not locked to disciples of Bellacor. And he is more, so it sounds like he's less resilient, right? 20 wounds, he can't be obscured. But he's minus one to hit. He's minus one to wound. He's minus one damage. And you can't reroll the hit roll against him. So he's pretty pretty terrifying in himself. He has an invulnerable ignoring demonic sword, which will cut through God knows what. Bellacor is a frightening character. And like I've said already, there's a reason why we've seen him in almost all Chaos Demons Battle Reports so far. Bellacor is very, very good. My second standout unit, I'm going to grab the codex for this one, and we're going to switch straight to the Slanesh section because you can do that now, like I mentioned. And my second standout unit for Chaos Demons is a surprising one. You've already heard me say it. I've jumped to the Sinesh section. Not corn, that's right. Fiends of Sinesh are remarkably good. They have a 14-inch base move as a beast. Now, because they're a beast, that means they can move through most terrain features because infantry beasts and swarms can move through most, uh, most terrain features. They have a weapon skill of 3+, plus, a strength of 5, a toughness of 4, 4 wounds, 4 attacks, and their demonic invulnerability save is a 5 plus 4 plus, so 4 plus against ranged attacks. So they're pretty well protected against range. When they do get into combat with those 4 attacks, their strength 5 minus 3, 3 damage with their barbed tail, which is a single malefic attack. Malefic means that you can't modify it. And then with their 4 attacks, that was with their 1 attack, sorry, their 4 attacks, they are strength 5 minus 2. 2 damage, right? 2 damage. While an enemy unit, excluding vehicles, is within engagement range of this unit, each time a model of that enemy unit makes an attack, subtract one from that hit roll so they're minus one to hit as well fiends are very 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 good and if people are bringing slanesh attachments or slash armies you will see fiends because i just think they're a great unit that are incredibly quick and incredibly tough when they hit in combat like fiends are a standout unit for me i think i'd like to add fiends but slanesh and corn they don't mix so we can't do that
Talking of the best god, Corn, the third and final standout unit, probably won't surprise you people, is Bloodthirsters. When I say Bloodthirsters, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop Scarbrand in that as well. I know he's a named character, but he's still a Bloodthirster of Corn. They're a standout unit for a couple of reasons. I used to deploy Bloodthirster, move Bloodthirster, remove Bloodthirster. That was what happened. I'd stick him on the table, I'd move him forward, he'd get shot to death, and I'd remove him straight away. They've only gone up by four wounds for a standard Bloodthirster, six for Scarbrand to go to 22, but 20 wounds for Bloodthirster now. But he's up to toughness eight, and he has a 4 plus 4 plus to Monarch and Run Ability, which makes him instantly tougher than he was before. Toughness 8, 20 wounds, 4 plus 4 plus, makes him very tough. You can give him an Exalted Ability, which means he can only take 8 wounds per phase. You can give him a Warlord Trait, which means he has a 5 up feel, no pain. You can give him a Relic, which means he gets plus 1 to his Demonic and Run Ability against 1 damage weapons. Like, suddenly this guy becomes an absolute resilient tank, not to mention that he hits you on the charge with 8 attacks, hitting on 2s, at strength 16, minus 4, d3, plus 3 damage. So he's terrifyingly good. Same number of attacks for Scarbrand. Same profile, apart from he ignores invulnerable saves. Granted, you can't give him the 8 wound cap, nor can you give him the 5 up for no pain, but Scarbrand is also terrifyingly good. I've had him do some epic deeds so far. If you want to see them, you need to check out some of the previous streams that we've already got on the channel or check out the battle reports on deploymentzone.tv. But I just think Bloodthirsters are horrifyingly scary now. And they're going to become a bullet magnet. People are going to want to kill them really quickly because of how scary they are. Two benefits to that. First of all, the rest of your army gets to tear across the table to attack the enemy. And secondly, they're more resilient. So you want to stick more firepower into them? Cool. Go for it. I've had... People fire armies into them and remove a few wounds. They're very scary. It's what they should be. They're greater demons. They're greater demons of corn. It's what they should be. For me, they are a standout unit in this codex. So before we go to the wrap up and what I actually think, what my overwhelming thoughts are on the codex and where I would place it, uh, we're going to talk about my three favorite stratagems, but I'm going to cheat and I'm going to use four. I'm going to use four because the way the stratagems work in this book, there are no demon specific stratagems, which are just for demons. You've got your four god specific stratagems, corn. Uh, Zinch, Nurgle, Slanesh. And each one of those gods has access to six, seven stratagems, and that's it. So you need multiple detachments to gain access to multiple sets of stratagems. So there's less of them. For me, that's a positive. Don't like the way stratagems are working currently. Don't like the way the stratagems are going. This is a huge positive change for me. This is top work. Again, I'm praising you, Games Workshop. Do more of this stuff, please. Um, so what I've done is I've picked a single stratagem from each god's page of stratagems, and that's become my favourite one for that particular deity. I think that's a fav my favourite way of doing it. Otherwise, I was just going to be picking three corn ones, because that's what I've been using so far since I've had this codex. So, number one is corn, because I've just gone in order. And the first one is contempt for sorcery. It's a hard mashup between this one and the banner of blood. Contempt for sorcery is really, really nice, because... It used to be scorn of sorcery. Opponent does a psychic test, is successfully manifested. Pick a corn demon unit within 24 inches, roll a dice on a four plus, you deny the power. Cool, okay, not bad, it was good. Now you do it after you've already attempted to deny the power. So if you have a unit of flesh hounds within range and you attempt to deny with that unit of flesh hounds and you fail, you can then use contempt for sorcery to still try and stop that power. More importantly, if it's flesh hounds that are using the, the stratagem, you get plus one to that roll as well. So it goes to a three plus. Really important when you consider a tournament play and you think about things like mental interrogation or um, any of those psychic-based uh, sec uh, psychic based secondaries, get flesh hounds hunting those psychers because you get to try and deny it, and if you fail to deny it, you can then use um, Contempt for Sorcery to then deny it on a 3+. plus. You get two stabs at denying a power, which gives your opponents points. It's very powerful. So second is Zinch, and it's called Warp Portal. And what you can do with Warp Portal is you can pick a Zinch Demon's character unit, one CP for a Herald, two CP for everything else, pick it up, redeploy it nine inches away from the enemy. Very zinchy, very trickery based. More importantly, means that your witch fires and stuff like that, you go up, up over here, down. I'm going to do my witch fires over here now. I really love that. And it's good for protecting your greater demons as well. Your greater demons are getting in the spot of bother. You're taking too much damage. Up, oh, up, over here now. We're going to hide them over here somewhere out of the way. It's harder to hide them. Again, they can't be obscured. But moving them out of range of things. Oh, you've just got your eradicators in range. Nope. Happens in the movement phase. So you still get your psychic phase as well. Um, it's a really nice power, a really nice um, stratagem. Quite like it. So number three, Nurgle's number, one of Nurgle's numbers, number three is a Nurgle stratagem called Revolting Constitution. It's a bit of a boring one, so I hate it and love it. I hate it because um, transhuman, which was a thing for Primaris, was very cool and narrative, and oh my god, they've got this cool rule that no one else has got, and now everyone's got it somewhere. 
and this is the version for demons revolting constitution is the demons version of transhuman so i hate it for that reason because it's the same thing that exists in every book under a slightly different name however i love it because stick on unit of plague bearers and suddenly you can't wound them on any unmodified wound rolls of a one two or three remember we were talking about how they're less resilient before it gives them a little bit of that resilience back allows them to survive a little bit longer so i'm a big fan of having access to that at least so you can put your unit of plague bearers out in the open well maybe not out in the open but you can be a little bit less fearful because you know you can put transhuman on them and they suddenly can't be wounded on a one two or a three they can only be un wounded on an unmodified roll of a four plus so it gives you some of that resilience back and considering we said that nurgle was one of the losers of the codex it's nice to have some access to some more resilience and then finally point number four or stratagem number four, is impossible elegance. You put on a slanesh character, give some transhuman to hit. So unmodified hit rolls of one, two, or a three always fail, irrespective of any abilities those weapons have. That's quite tasty. That's very good. I suddenly charge in my invulnerable ignoring scar brand. Not that invulnerable ignoring actually makes a difference because of a demonic invulnerable. Anyway, I charge in a bloodthirster or a scar brand or anything like that into um, a slanesh keeper of secrets and you drop that particular stratagem on her and suddenly i'm only hitting you on fours even if i am at full health so it's really nice keeps your great demons alive longer that's a positive so there you go there's my 15 stroke 16 hot take because we added an extra stratagem in at the end so we had one for each god that's what that's my standouts from from codex chaos demons i know it's late i'm very sorry i'm very sorry that it's late hopefully you guys still find value in this book anyway it's a really good book. If you're a Demons fan or you've been thinking about picking up Demons for a while, you've been thinking about collecting Demons, it's a really, really, really good book to pick up and play with. It's a nice book. It's a fun book. It's balanced. It's not broken. I don't think we're going to see Demons curb something people everywhere. It's elegant. It's well put together. I'm a huge, huge, huge fan of this codex. And I think Games Workshop have done a great job. And like I said, a massive thank you for them sending it out to me. Where would I place this? Well, if we're going to go in terms of competitiveness... In the current scene, competitively, maybe a 6.5 or a 7, I would go as far as say. However, if we're going to place this on how well this book's put together and where I think codexes should be in 9th edition, I'm more likely to give it around a 9. Yeah, there's two different scores, I know. Because against things like Tau and some of the current still probably top tier armies out there, I think this book's still going to struggle. I still think it's not going to have a great time against heavy firepower armies that can just pick it off the table before we get across the tabletop. But they've definitely got more tricks. However, it's simpler. It's well put together. It's well laid out. It's well thought out. The rules aren't wildly complicated. There's almost no room for any like problems of interpretation. There's some little issues around... Um, certain rules in here, very minimal. The FAQ for this is not going to be big, I feel. And for that reason, I think this is a good book. If you're thinking about picking it up, pick it up. If you want to pick it up, make sure you use the Element Games link in the video description below. I will link this codex directly. That is an affiliate link where you directly support the channel and we get 5% kickback for every purchase you make via that link. Be warned, if you do use that link, it will drop a cookie in your web browser if you accept cookies, and it will sit there for 30 days. And every purchase you make from Element for those 30 days will be affiliated to the channel, unless you pick a different channel's affiliate link, in which case that replaces the old cookie. But it's another way of supporting the channel. So if you're not a member, you could become a member. However, if you don't want to become a member, but you want to pick up more sweet plastic goodies, you can use the link, and we still get a 5% kickback. And you're buying those things anyway. We're just very, very grateful for the support. So use the link please anyway that's it that's my thoughts for codex chaos demons i've had lots of fun using them so far i feel like the people i've played against have had lots of fun playing against them as well so that's really really good that's a really nice place for a codex to be i don't feel like i can pull this codex out my bag and someone's gonna go oh i don't want to i don't want to play like i don't feel like i feel like i'm gonna be there so that's a huge positive so top work games workshop guys what do you think of chaos demons are you happy with the changes did you previously play a specific god and you're not so happy with the changes the only two people i think maybe maybe sinesh might be a little bit miffed that they lost i think it was fights first and nerg will probably be let me know let me know in the comments below what you think of this codex let me know if you've picked it up let me know if you're picking it up let me know if you're excited to play it let me know the sort of things you're putting together, the sort of combinations you're looking at. I'm excited to see what you guys do with Codex Chaos Demons. 
that's it for me anyway. Like I said at the beginning of the video, if you love what we do, if you want to support these videos, one of the easiest ways you can do that is by hitting that subscribe button. It's free, costs you nothing, really helps us out as a channel, especially if you continue to watch our content. It's a it's a big boon for us to gain subscribers from content like this. So massive, massive thank you. If you really, really love what we do here, we've got a lot more content coming in the near future and you could support us by becoming a channel member. Hit that join button, look at all the different perks you get from the different levels and pick the one that's most appropriate to you. We have a very very active very busy thriving hobby community in the great hall so even at the very lowest level that doesn't get you access to members only content you do get access to our community discord server and you can come and hang out with us for a measly two pounds a month it's a great place it's very supportive and if you're just a bit lonely it's a good place to come and hang out Thank you to everybody who's already a member of the channel. You guys mean the world to us. Thank you so much for supporting this. Let me know what you think of this video in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you in the next one.